guys. <laughs> I hope my mic's working. Last week I got I started the show in absolute silence. It looks like it's working. I'm going to turn off my other thing. There we go. Oh, guys, I'm Kevin the Comic Doctor, a comic book presser. I'm also an authorized dealer located way up. CGC dealer, that is. <laughs> the other kind of dealer, maybe, on my off nights. Uh, located way up in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. And this is another edition of One on One. Tonight, guys, we're going to talk a little bit about the Fantastic Four because, yes, the cast has been announced. And I'm so excited to have with me today because I've been wanting to have this gentleman on the show forever. Ever since I thought of even having a YouTube channel, I want to bring Robert on the show. And I've talked about Robert on the show before. Rob, I have mentioned you before. Uh, I always well, you've been on my show, of course. A few times, a few times. And you've generously given gifts uh, yeah. to uh, viewers? Well, during COVID, everyone was so sad. And, you know, and those movies were still coming out. And everyone was still getting... Everyone was kind of looking forward to those movies that were coming. Those MCU films. And so... Uh, you know, comic related films. We were giving out gifts over at the uh, at the Burnett work, and a lot of. And I was there for it. You were you there. You gave out some great books. That was great. Slabbed books. That's right. Slab books, man. It's it's good stuff. And and uh, and uh, you know, we're 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 still doing a lot of work with CGC, as everyone knows. Uh, I'd love to come back on your show again and give out more stuff. If you, I would love that. Me. By the way, you know, uh, last week the uh, omnibus of the original ROM run came out. Did you buy it? Of course I did. <laughs> of course I did. I got to tell you, I know it's sacrilegious, but you can see behind me. Oh, yes. On I'll this level. I mean, I I, I have uh, ungodly amounts of... I don't have gem mints. He has every omnibus. Yeah, I don't have every everything. omnibus. But I, I, I wouldn't mind. I love the omnibuses. And I love the absolute editions and the DC hardcovers. And, um, now, well... You, that's I'm glad you mentioned that, Rob, because the last few guests I've had on here, I've, I've you know, I'm not sure if my if my uh, subscribers know exactly who you are, and I didn't want I didn't want to start the uh, you know bring you on the show initially and talk about the Fantastic Four. I want to come on here and talk about you actually, because I find your no, I, I really do. I find your your journey, your life's journey, very fascinating. You're living in California. You're still you know uh, plugging away, doing the doing your art, and I think it's fantastic. And plugging away, yeah. Yeah, yep. I want to I want to have you on here just to talk about that someday because I find that awesome, and I want to get a full origin story. But since uh, you're here for the first time, maybe give uh, some of the the viewers a real quick quick I mean rundown of your if your your time with comic books. You mentioned the omnibuses. You were a comic collector. Yeah. So uh, well, uh, I'll tell you. Like as a uh, when I was a little kid, I collected comic books. You know, you'd buy them off the rack when you'd go places. Your parents would buy you a little stack of comics you could read in the car or whatever. Right. So I liked comic books. Uh, my favorite, uh, the 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 first comic that I read regularly was Justice League of America, starting around issue ninety five of the original run. That's pretty early. And my mom would actually buy them for me. And my favorite. My favorite thing in the world was when the JSA and the JLA would team up once a year. That's awesome. And then I remember, I think it's giant size. It was it was a 100-page giant size special of JLA 111. Right. I think it was 111 where they had the Crisis on Earth 3 storyline, that it was a reprint of that story because it was 100 pages. They'd do reprints and then a new story. And mm -hmm. and I love that was my favorite thing, the evil, the, the crime syndicate. Um, so you hung that. your hat in the Marvel Universe. Oh, sorry, the DC universe. No, no. Yeah, I mean, I really like the DC, and it's because of the Super Friends and really Amigo action figures. You know, I the first two Amigo figures they released superhero wise were Batman with the removable cowl and Superman. Right. And the Marvel figures came later, but they were all under under the world's great. It didn't when Amigo released the characters, they really didn't delineate between Marvel. I mean, they did on the boxes, but you know, I just wanted the superheroes, and then I kind of got out of it. And what brought me back into comics, I was on my paper route and there was a kid reading this kid, Robbie Cullen. He was on his front stoop. Why? He was reading Camelot 3000 number four. Oh, yeah. I heard this. And, impressed. you know, and yeah, and DC put it out. It was Baxter paper and Brian yeah. Boland wrote it. And Mike Barr, or Mike Barr wrote it and Boland drew it. And I looked at this. I'm like, what is this? Yep. You know, and I, I, it was like, unlike any comic book I'd ever seen And Seattle has this had this it still does actually it's the same comic store called golden age collectibles it's been there for 50 years right and the pike place market and i went down there and you know i think i got frank miller's ronin ronin had come out and they were just starting to release like the first baxter books were uh legion of superheroes and teen titans and um and then my friend shade gave me moon knight 
And so I read the Bill Sienkiewicz, Doug Mensch, Moon Knight, which was a, um, it was a direct sale book. Right. Marvel had gone direct sale only with Kazar, Micronauts, and, and Moon Knight. And I, I, you know, I love the sort of noir aspects, the kind of more of a romantic Batman type of a deal. And I, I got totally sucked in and it got to the point where I was going down at the time. I want to say it was, it wasn't Wednesdays when new comics came out. It was, I, maybe it was Thursday. Some it was a different day because they switched, and then I um, then I went. I bought comics every week for thirty years. Now, so Camelot three thousand would have been around like the early 80s, 84, it, 85, wasn't it? No, it was before that. Was it earlier? Than yeah, that? it was like eighty three. Eighty three. Yeah, okay. and that's why Ronin had come out, and then right. they were doing all these really interesting Baxter reprints, and then there were other books coming out like um, Alien Worlds and Twisted Tales. Right, and those are and a lot of the indie books, uh, American Howard Chaykin's American Flag, right. still one of my favorite comics. His Omnibus for Times Square came out this week, okay, um, where he finally finished the trilogy that, we, that he never finished thirty five years ago or whatever. And I loved, I loved those books. And then they also released things like the Death of Captain Marvel or in 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 on Baxter re releases, and then DC was putting out all kinds of books like. They were, and I, I started first. I'm like, I'm only going to buy sci-fi or off-brand books, right? But then I, I, I bought the first New Teen Titans one through fifty-three, and then I read those, and I got into the Baxter Teen Titans. I'm like, ah, I'm not going to read Legion, and then I started reading Legion, and then I started buying everything, you oh, know. Yeah. And and the whole mid '80s, from like '82 up, actually, the, for the rest of the '80s, because then Vertigo came in and Sandman yeah. came in, but. It was a really exciting time to be buying comics because there was such a diversity of kinds of stories that were being told, not just superhero stories, but you know, I was I was buying the American reprints um, of uh, 2000 AD stuff like Judge Dredd mm -hmm. or um, you know Strontium Dog, and and there was all those those books were coming out, and First Comics was releasing books and the star slayer mike rell was doing star slayer and and then oh, yeah. uh, timothy truman and john uh, grim jack and all of these books there was so much cool stuff coming out and it it was just a a wonderful time to be buying books and then over at dc crisis on infinite earth and then of course watchmen and the dark knight returns Thanks, and yeah. and then the reboot after crisis when you had john byrne doing superman and perez taking over wonder, wonder woman, woman and yeah it was, and then same stuff like when when Frank Miller came back and did Board Again, you know, on Daredevil, mm -hmm. and there was there was all <clears throat> kinds of great stuff. So going, and what was really interesting was, while there really weren't comic book movies, but a lot of the comic book stores also had a musical component. They would sell like alternative CDs and college radio stuff, and yep. so you go to the comic book store and then you buy great music. So I kind of made a circuit. I'd go to the comic book store. I'd go to Tower Records. Cool. And so it was all kind of all combined. So the 80s for me was a really great time for pop culture. And there was never this idea that anything sucked. You right. know, things things might not have been as good as you wanted them to be, but they didn't suck. Like nothing sucked. It was just, oh, that was, that was pretty good. Do <laughs> you know, things, the, things suck today, Rob? <laughs> uh, th well, the, I, I think there's a lot more suckage because back yeah. then there wasn't as much on the line, right. you know, and, and comics were still sort of underground. Not a lot of people read them. And, and I was never one of those, <clears throat> oh, I'm not going to listen to this indie band because they've gotten too commercial. Right. You know, I was never that guy. But what was really interesting was, you know, when George Perez came back and like he'd never really written anything before. And he was writing Wonder Woman as well as drawing it and leaned into the mythology. And it was, it was really good. cool. It was, yeah, I yeah. was, yeah, I really was really, I've got a hard cover of it there. And, you know, I started, I bought, but I bought a lot of garbage, to be honest. Did like, you still have it? Like, well, I got rid of a lot of them. Right. I got rid of all my, a lot of my books because I just got sick of them. You know, when we moved in here, I'm like, I started going through my comic collection and knowing you and then really getting into CGC and seeing slabbed books. I realized that I there was some keys. Of course, there's keys in the 80s that are good, but not that many. Like, if you really go back and start looking into 80s comics, there's some that are worth something, sure. But for the most part, my comic book collection was not what I would call... I, I wasn't buying... 
<laughs> things to because they were worth money. Or and none of us were. Like who who was really doing that back? I mean, maybe some smart fellows were, but we were buying the. I, I bought like like you. I bought everything. I bought the oh, everything DC put out, everything Marvel put out. Yeah. My entire paycheck went to that on Friday afternoon or Friday evening. Yeah. I mean, I was buying like 30 books a week. Yeah, easy. Me too. And, and it was, and, and I was reading them all, yeah. you know, and, and I just love the stories. For me, it was the, and of course the art, um, but it was, it was, you know, it was a time when Sinkevich only drew Moon Knight for 30 issues, then left and Kevin Nolan came in and took over. So it, comic books were kind of a constantly changing. I mean, you know, I remember when Claremont, like I love the X-Men. Yep. I love the X-Men and, and it, they got a little repetitive i mean i have to say i i've st almost stopped buying comic books in general about five years ago and i only buy omnibuses or hardcovers or um because i'm a not just it's not just that i'm a snob i'm a snob about the books i mean i like having hardcover sure. books but but i'll tell you there are two marvel things marvel has got me back their new ultimate spider-man storyline right that's oh, going I on that. i heard it's great it's great it, it's great and um and also i loved I, a lot of people didn't like it because it's a obviously it's a little weird house of x and powers of 10 right the, the hickman run on on x-men i'm like oh yeah because i love the x-men i mean you can uh, right here i've got a whole you know there's there's a there's a shelf there there's got to be what 30 x-men omnibuses here god only knows how much i paid for them all but mm -hmm. but i i i love the x-men and it was just the same thing over and over and over again just variations on a theme until the hickman run you know i read about it, i'm like that's interesting and and i waited you know i waited to get the hardcover when it came out mm -hmm. and i was blown away so and you're back, I, you're back at it again which is cool all right yeah yeah, yeah i mean but only for a few things like I, the hickman run i've still been waiting like i just got along with with um with the raw like i love getting raw i love getting the comics i grew up with in because it makes it easier to read i hated flipping through my books and taking them off i fought. didn't you say you were gonna at one point you were gonna you're gonna bound them all or something like that you said i'm gonna just bind them all yeah I, yeah i uh i bound my atari force run okay All because right. that was never going to get that was never going to get reprinted and bound and i love that i loved atari force you know jerry conway and jose luis garcia lopez who i right. uh, who i learned about when he took over teen titans the baxter book of teen titans he came on board and started drawing uh brother blood yeah marco i'm right there with you house <laughs> and powers and and a lot of people didn't like it but for a science fiction fan the what they did with the mutants was such a it was so far beyond what they had done because the comics were so you know they they had leaned in that direction when they came up with things like utopia and genosha and all that but um but now i'm sort of the spider-man run is really really interesting they i mean obviously it's an alternate timeline future kind of a thing but it's still really interesting it's like a really good elseworld story because right, right. the um you know, superhero comics just eventually get boring because there's only so many stories you can tell. Yeah, you gotta you gotta you know pass it on to fresh uh, to fresh uh, writers, I think, and uh, bring in new artists who are a little more you know think of. I mean, look how Spider Man was drawn for all those years. Like Ditko did it for so long, and then Romita took over, and then everybody after Romita copied Romita until McFarlane right. came around, and then that exploded. I mean, I, I still think of like I talked about Spawn number one the other days, opening Spawn number one. As a young artist myself, it's like what the heck? What is this? Is unbelievable, right? It yeah, was, you know, it, it's color. and that was that was another thing. You know, watching <laughs> Image Comics. I mean, they they the nineteen ninety four uh, 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 San Diego Comic Con. I've been going to Comic Con since eighty eight. Yes, and uh, the ninety four Comic Con. It was like imagine your favorite rock band showing up at an arena rock show. <laughs> Image shows up. Awesome. Rob Liefeld brought a one to one scale young blood spaceship that you could go into and oh my gosh i mean it was insane and um that was really exciting and seeing those books but the thing that mcfarland did was he made sure that book came out on time every month yeah you know that spawn and uh, comic came out and ev no one else could could i mean i liked wildcats even though it was sort of a variation on but they weren't coming out on time you know whereas mcfarland's like nope every month gonna i'm gonna come. put out spawn you know and um that was uh that was fun so that's kind of how i got 
got back into comics and it's funny like i didn't buy the the judgment day mini series the uh avengers mm-hmm. x-men and eternals i got that last week along with rom okay and uh it was great <laughs> i was like this is great i love this oh, you know okay. it, was, it was really interesting and it, it made sense and it was i really i really had fun with that that crossover what got you out of comics and i guess in the early 90s you kind of Nah, no, right. no, I, I I bought comics all the way up through the mid two th- oh, almost the 2010. Oh, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah, I got yeah, it. So, I got it after ten years. I was done. Okay. See, and I I I did. I I was going to get it. my favorite comic of all time is Neil Gaiman's Sandman because it's about storytelling. Right. And I you know I loved all the Vertigo books and the Vertigo books. Man, I adored those when they folded Hellblazer and Swamp Thing and then Sandman mm-hmm. and the whole Vertigo line, all the stuff they did like Kid Eternity and Shade the Changing Man and all this crazy stuff that they were putting out, Doom Patrol and um, the Invisibles. And they, they, there were so many really cool books. And again, a lot of them have come out. You know, I've got all the omnibuses are on this level the dc stuff's on this level but uh <laughs> that's heavy to move to that stuff <laughs> dude it's the worst it's yeah. the absolute worst moving all these books but but um yeah no it's it's great it's uh but yeah comics are and you know now i think what's what's interesting is the movies have su- sort of supplanted the the comics and and i think the problem now is that you have a younger generation of writers that have come up and there's a lot of self insertion of writers writing about themselves in their uh, comics yes as opposed to what's so interesting to me is that storytellers the way at least having been a consumer of storytelling my entire life in all of its myriad forms storytelling to me was about authors trying to make sense of the world that we live in mm-hmm. so when they were telling stories they were telling stories that were meant to appeal to the entire audience to everybody you know that and if you read something when you were younger you might come back to it as an adult and um it it's the same story but it might hit you differently but nowadays i see these authors so many of them are writing about themselves and what's interesting to me about that is when i first heard the term mary sue mm-hmm. i heard it in relation to star trek writers and for me a mary sue a mary sue story was the writer themselves would write an avatar of them um, of themselves as a character, like an ensign who worked lower decks on the enterprise. Right. And then that ensign would wind up saving the crew, saving our principal characters. Right. And there, there was a few Star Trek novels that were written that way. And they, they quickly tamped down on that. But to me, that was a Mary Sue story. Uh, and, and it wasn't like a character being overpowered who could do anything. Mm-hmm. That to me, wasn't a Mary Sue. That was just a bad, badly written character. A Mary Sue was something that the author themselves was obviously writing themselves or an avatar that represented them into the story. And it sort of, it sort of took away from the main character. And I see a lot of that. There's a lot of people that they, you know, the the sort of activist writer, they're like, you need to understand uh, I'm part of a, a minority or an oppressed group, but I'm going to write myself into this. But the thing is the great stories already did that. You know, they already did that, but in a, in a way where you, they were looking outward, like you read a story like Claremont's God Loves, Man Kills, mm-hmm. that X-Men story, which was horrifying. And the whole idea of mutants, it, the mutants were the oppressed class. You know, the whole idea of of mutants being outcasts and from society and, and, and so much of the stories that Claremont especially wrote was about that very thing. And but it was about that thing on a societal level, as more so than a personal level. Claremont wasn't writing about himself, and the problem is when you're writing about yourself, the stories aren't as good. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's and that's really what it comes down to: are the stories good? Do they appeal to you? And do they appeal to your audience? And um, I would say a lot of the time recently, I haven't read a lot of things that uh, have appealed to me. Whereas the House of X and Powers of X, when I read that, I'm like, wow, this is so weird. This is so delightfully strange what they've done with the X-Men and resurrection from the dead and, and all that. I'm like, all this stuff, I'm like, oh, I'm so here for this because it felt like I was reading 70s sci-fi, like all these weird concepts and things. I'm like, yeah, that's what I want. 
So something, something not quite so run of the mill, right? Like you said, something outside the box, something you've yeah. seen in a long time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and again, this, I guess the same can be said or very similarly to the movies we see, right? I mean, uh, when when do they start going down this uh, down this toward path that? Uh, well, know? you know, it's 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 so funny because I've watched Comic Con, for instance. When I first went to Comic Con, it was a bunch of sweaty dudes rifling through long boxes, right? Rightly or wrongly, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. My YouTube channel, I've been doing it for five years, is 96% male. And and I, I understand there's, I watched the female audience. It, it was comics like Death and Emily the Strange, you know, Neil Gaiman's Death. Yep. And then you watched in the 90s when anime really did it. Anime and gaming brought the female audience in, stuff like Sailor Moon and, and yeah. things like that. And then you'd see a lot more female audience members come to Comic-Con, which is great. Right. And now you go to Comic-Con and it's multi-generations of families and it's all, and, and and audiences look for different things. Like men and women are not looking for the exact same thing when they're reading stories. They're looking for different things. And like men and women, like women don't care very much about movie gossip. They want to go to a movie and if they like it, they'll, you know, they'll internalize it or whatever, but they're not hanging on whether or not Wolverine and Deadpool is going to be great or Deadpool and Wolverine. They're, I mean, they want it to be great, but, but we look for different things because men and women are, are different. You know, audiences are looking for different kinds of things. Be careful. You might get in trouble for saying that. Well, I mean, I, I think it bears it. I, 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 but I mean, my, but that's the thing. My YouTube analytics don't mm -hmm. lie. That's right. You know, and, and I'm I'm looking at my YouTube analytics, 96% male audience. Uh that that's that tells you what you need to know. I mean, I'm covering the entertainment business. Right. And the entertainment business is not, you know, it's just like if I was doing a channel on plumbing, you know, I don't oh. think or or HVAC work. I don't mm -hmm. think that you'd have a lot of females that are in that line of work. Right. Uh, they're not going to be watching your HVAC channel. Um, and I don't think that's sexist to say because the analytics would bear that out. And and what was interesting is is that it's the kinds of stories that we're consuming. You know, stories about male power fantasies are different than what uh, what the stories that appeal to women. And what's really interesting is if you go to Japan, and the reason manga has become so popular is because the storytelling in manga. They tell so many different kinds of stories in different ways about different kinds of people, you know, and, and manga, you can find manga about anything. I mean, you want to read manga about a guy who's on a golf team. Mm -hmm. There's a golf manga to, for you to, to, to watch. And so that's why manga, I think the diversity of the kinds of stories that have been told because they're, they're, uh, there's so many different kinds of stories you can watch a movie like Princess Mononoke and Princess Mononoke that's a great movie I love Studio Ghibli but there's that movie appeals to not just men it appeals to women as well and and so the Japanese there's a reason why the Japanese manga market has become so huge because the American comic market has has sort of let down its readership I think and it's funny because I was reading I remember when like Viz Comics started putting up uh, printing manga in the United States. And I started reading stuff like Lone Wolf and Cub. Mm -hmm. I read Area 88, The Legend of Kamui, um, Dirty Pear, uh, Yuritsai Yatsura, or whatever you have mm -hmm. pronounced that. I'm not gonna and try. I, yeah, and I and I was I was reading all of that stuff and I loved it. You know, I mean it was great. Uh yeah, and and you know, you, you talk about your uh your analytics. I've got analytics too. These uh, at my shop every uh, Saturday, it's it's not, you know, the only time a, a woman or a lady will walk in is they're buying something for their 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 uh, their mate or their partner. Right. Like the, that, I shouldn't say I have no female clients, but like, honestly, uh, you know, as one that comes to mind right off the bat, the rest are all guys. So, yeah. I mean, well, they're not because uh, because, look, women collect things. You know, my mom collect collected beanie babies and things like that, but <laughs> yeah. not in not, not in the same way. You know, like like men will want all hundred pops of a certain series. A woman will get like three or four or five if she likes pops. She doesn't yeah. need all of them. Yeah, that's uh, that's our hoarding collect the collect the collector hoarder and all of us guys. You know, um, yeah, we want all we want the full set. 
Well, because we like, I mean, men are obsessed with things. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why men become mechanics and men like rebuilding cars. And I'm not saying women don't, but the predominant amount of women, they're interested in other kinds of things. Right. You know, and that's what makes the world a great place. That's why Valentine's Day is a good thing. (laughs) Do you think uh, the fact that uh, women like other things and men like certain things that perhaps... That is why some of these late, latest <laughs> superhero movies have not been well, well received. Well, I think the, the I think the place where men and women meet is we all love great stories well told. Amen. And and and, and I think that the, a, a movie does not become successful unless it has the general audience, you know, the four quadrant audience. Mm-hmm. And like you know, you can have a movie like the Shawshank Redemption, and. I don't even know if there's a woman character. There's Andy Dufresne's wife who gets murdered, but there's, you know, the, that's a film where everybody can, can love that movie, Mm -hmm. you know? And I, and I think it, 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 it had, the story has to be genuine and, and people, all audiences, young, old, male, female, Democrat, Republican, straight, gay, religious, non-religious, everybody can recognize whether a story is honest mm-hmm. and no, look, I like a lot of stories that are admittedly bad. Like I'll, 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 I'll tell you, there's a lot of B movies, movies that I'm probably, I, I would never necessarily admit to people. I love as much as I love, but I love them anyway, but mm-hmm. I know they're not good. I know that if I told somebody like, for instance, I love this movie called stone cold that stars Brian Bosworth and Lance Henriksen. It's about a cop in a total early nineties mullet frosted tips played by a non-actor yep. going undercover in an, in, a, in a biker gang. Right. Um, it's totally rock and roll. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's loud music, it's boobs, it's beer, it's bad behavior. It's all that stuff. Would I recommend that movie to everybody? No, <laughs> but if you watch it in the, in the, in the spirit, it was intended. The people that made that movie, they made exactly the movie they set out to make and they did it really, really well. And Lance Hendrickson is the villain. It's one of his greatest turns ever as a villain. And when you watch that movie, that movie never doesn't put a smile on my face. I laugh about that movie from the opening scene to the end of the movie. It's delightful to me. Now, is it for everybody? No. Would I give it to people if I if I wanted them to show if I wanted to show my impeccable taste and the timeless beauty of cinema? Would I give them Stone Cold? No, no. But but if I said okay, I'm going to give you ten B movies that represent a certain level of filmmaking and a style of storytelling, I might mm-hmm. I might qualify it and say okay, here's ten movies like Arnold Schwarzenegger's Commando, awesome. Like, Terminator 2 is a highbrow Schwarzenegger movie. Mm -hmm. Commando is not highbrow, but which is the better Schwarzenegger film? Now, Terminator 2 is the better movie. But Commando, (laughs) but Commando, if you want to watch Schwarzenegger v. Schwarzenegger, I don't know. I mean, I would say Terminator 2 is a great science fiction action adventure. Yep. But as a Schwarzenegger movie, he's cool playing the t800 but i like commando he carries a log in that one right in commando i haven't seen that in so yeah. long yeah yeah, uh, yeah. but the girl i mean from, he's uh, throwing who... saw blades from a from a That's from a right. table i mean it's it the, the movie's hilarious oh, we all seen those for sure so you know but i would i would say that stone cold would make a pretty good double bill with commando but okay. not a good double bill with terminator 2 interesting interesting okay yeah i, I haven't seen stone cold or maybe i have i just don't remember but i don't think i did I, I just, uh, you talk about B-movies. I guess it's a B-movie. Uh, I, I, I you saw all those movies that my son and I picked up last week. I sent you a picture. We bought yeah. 550 DVDs. So we, got a, we got a blockbuster in our, in, our, in, our, in our backyard garage here. We go every weekend. We pick up, we picked out Corvette Summer. Dude, that movie's great. Yeah, Did you watch it? it? Oh, yeah. We loved it. He, he it, absolutely loved it. Corvette Summer. Okay. For those of you who don't know, Mark Hamill made Corvette Summer between Star Wars and Empire. Right. And it's it's actually, I think, a legitimately great call it a coming of age story about a boy in his car, um, about learning hard truths about life. It's also got some great action scenes. It's really funny. Yep. It's it's a it's a great movie. 
And am I weird? Annie Potts is freaking hot in that movie, right? Hot as she's cr- well. <laughs> you, I love when Mark Hamill goes. You were making a dirty movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, it's a great movie. Warner Archive put that out on Blu-ray. Yeah. So um, I love Corvette Summer. That was a perennial on cable when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I must have watched that movie fifty times. Yeah, I, I I love that movie growing up. Again, it was one of you know Luke Skywalker in a different movie in a regular place, you know, and just the, the just the, again I'm a big car buff too, so seeing that Corvette get all you know refinished and restored from nothing, it's yeah, that probably actually well, probably inspired me to do a lot of the restoration work because I was always he took this piece of garbage and turned it into this. Well, and that was right? that was what was so cool is this so Corvette Summer for the audience out there is a movie about these high school kids and they have an auto shop class led by mark hamill and they restore this corvette and it's a very 70s looking yeah. corvette but when you see it it's awesome mm-hmm. like it's this awesome car and of course it gets stolen and you you can all relate to that you're like oh man because it wasn't just like kids trying to get laid it was they were making something you know and the and everybody did their part and it was mark hamill's dream and they do mm-hmm. it and and there's there's a there's a pretty big revelation about that in the movie and you're Life. like yeah oh man mm-hmm. so and how old's your son he's 13 so he and he loved the movie he loved the movie i was about that age well i was a bit younger when i saw it but yeah he loved it he loved yeah it. that he was around it. me too around that age and yeah. and that that movie is so it's so good and they don't make movies like that anymore that's right you know because it had a hard edge to it even though it was fun yeah. And it was about a kid in high school. Well, what Annie Potts wanted was going to Vegas to, to follow her dream. And her dream was, that was kind of strange. It's, you know, it was like, that was a weird, yeah, I'm going to be a, a hooker. I was like, okay, that's every, every girl grows up to want to be a hooker. I, I Not, kinda, Well, now every girl grows up to be an OnlyFans star. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Which is more, that's just a more legitimized form of it all. You're yeah. not on the streets. You're just at home in your bedroom. Oh, don't. <laughs> we're not gonna go. We're not. Let's not go there with this. That's all I need. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know. I know. Yeah, but yeah, we could go on and on about that joke. Had. I'm not a replicant. No, no, of course not. No, no, not at all. Not at all. But we did come here to talk about fantastic. See, I had a feeling we'd go down that rabbit hole. I just want everybody to just kind of listen, guys. Rob knows what he's talking about. He ain't no uh, faker. He's a he's a diehard comic book fan. Uh, very well read, as you obviously can tell. Uh, but Rob's also, well, he lives just, you're not in Hollywood now, you're outside of Hollywood, but you are, you've, you've written a couple of things, you've produced a few things, you've directed a few things. So, yep. you, you know, you are, uh, you know, a Hollywood person, you're, uh, but you're also a bit of a fanboy, right? I guess you call Total. me a fanboy. I am too. Uh, and so I wanted to reach out to you because you, you have your finger on the pulse of Hollywood. And I'm sure you're inside. People have told you all sorts of information that you can share with my audience here. Or maybe not, but we're, we're here. Well, there's to talk. things I can't actually about oh. this particular movie that I can't say. And you do know some information. Interesting. Okay, I saw I saw a picture of you now whether or not it was real or not of the of the of the new Fantastic Four logo. It could have been a fr- before I came. No, they the released movie. so Marvel released uh, right. a, 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 a imi- an art image on Instagram, right? And it was really interesting because I saw it as soon as I woke up, and I'm like, oh. They've confirmed that it's and, and I didn't look at everything always right. or anything like that. I was the, and I thought it was a really clever way because the <clears throat> Criterion Collection, which is a uh, they uh, they release classic and, and foreign films every year. They'll release like a um, a drawing, and in the drawing you're supposed to it's they leave you clues as to what movies they're going to release that year in the drawing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I looked at this and I went, oh, they're telling us it's a period piece, right? Because the the Marvel logo is actually the Cinerama logo, and if you like the the Cinerama Theater, we had that that logo is in Los Angeles. The Cinerama Theater is closed, and then it was really funny. And I'm like, uh, Ben Grimm is reading a Life magazine. It's although you don't see the logo, but I'm like, that's an actual Life magazine cover. And I knew, I just didn't know when it was from, and it's from December of 1963. And and so. It was funny because I got up to this morning like eight o'clock. And I'm like, look, John, you know, I'm sending John yeah. this stuff. Yeah. And and there's a obviously an Apollo, uh, it's like a Neil famous picture of Neil Armstrong, but it's you know, Ben Grimm that's above where he's sitting in his little right. And so I'm like, okay, this movie takes place in the 60s, which which is what I've been hearing. We speculated it could be, but I've heard that it was taking place. I've heard a lot of crazy stuff about the Fantastic Four, things I can't say about it. Right. 
but I, it, all of it makes me uh, excited. Me too. So, so when I saw that, I'm like, all right, you know, I was into it. So I, uh, yeah, I saw that logo and I've been hearing the same thing. I've been listening to you guys talk all the time about you and Campy over on his channel and on your own channel as well, too, uh, about it being a period piece or taking place in the sixties, which, you know, it's freaking amazing. I love it. I love that right off the bat, but what got me really excited today, I don't know how I, I didn't listen to you, anything you said. I think you were, were you at John Campia's place today doing the yeah. show? Yeah. So I didn't hear any of that. I haven't had a chance. It's Valentine's Day. You go for dinner. It's Valentine's Day. And I'm spending it with you, Rob. Uh, <laughs> evening, evening. My wife well, thank you. Out on the, on the, she watched her shows and she's probably sleeping by now. But, um, but the cast, oh my God, I'm freaking beside myself. I'm extremely happy with the cast. I, I assume you guys were too. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 you know, you know, I'll tell you something that cast has for me, um, gravitas because one of the things that I haven't liked about the last iterations of fantastic four is I thought everyone was too young. I know they went really young, um, with, uh, you know, at Michael B. Jordan, who I really love as an actor and miles teller, but I thought it was too young to me. Reed Richards in the comics was always in his forties. Right. I always saw him as a 40 in his 40s. So to make him younger never made sense to me. And I understand they they wanted to get a younger movie going audience, but it never really worked. And, you know, uh, to be honest, the only time I really loved Pedro Pascal as an actor was in Game of Thrones. Right. Because he was allowed to be charismatic and you couldn't take your eyes off him. Right. He had that braggadocio and he was larger than life and he was a lot of fun. And I feel... Like with the Mandalorian, you never really got to enjoy him. Right. But when you've seen him in things like he was in e Equalizer 2, I think. Equalizer 2. Was, it, was he in Equalizer 2? Uh, wasn't he? Yeah, it was in Equalizer 2. Um, I think it was Equalizer 2. And then he does, like when he shows up on Saturday Night Live, and he's done a lot of other roles where I think he's allowed to shine more. Right. I think that he'll be great in, in this role. And Vanessa Kirby, I think, will be a great Sue Storm. And... Um, the guy they cast as Ben Grimm is very, very funny. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, from Stranger Things, we got a good Johnny Storm. And I, I think that they've, I mean, he's a great actor. And he has the right, again, the bravado that he can be Johnny Storm. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I, I know that Marvel has a, a lot riding on this. So um, I'm hoping. Oh, is that with your kids? Yeah, my kids met him you know, back in 2022. And yeah. they were they were absolutely beside themselves. They were he was so nice to them, you know. He was so like my son, he was visit, you know, obviously very excited. Uh, my daughter, too, obviously, he was like he was kind of a heartthrob back then, although the picture is kind of strange looking, <laughs> stranger things in that picture, but but he was just a very nice guy to them. He took a couple seconds to talk to them, which I thought was really good because I've been to Fed Expo oftentimes, and they and the people are just kind of next, 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 you know, how right? Was, yeah, you yeah, know. of course. But uh, but I, I so I think it's I think it's going to be good, and I think making it a period piece, you know, I've often said that if they should have when they rebooted after Infinity War and Endgame, they needed to start over, like yes. like go back in their own minds. What happened where where Endgame left the MCU was in a shambles. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't even know who the Avengers are, who's left, right? And you know, start over again, and and Far From Home kind of started to do that. But what I what I wanted them to do was start over, and I think I think making the Fantastic Four a period piece, the way Captain America: The First Avenger was a period piece, mm -hmm. and it's it's the space age. You know, we have the Mercury Seven astronauts, the Gemini program. Uh, we're ramping up with the Apollo program, and because that Lyndon Johnson cover was there, uh, it leads me to believe it, it takes place in sixty four after Kennedy was assassinated. I would assume Kennedy's now. Because with that cover, it's saying to me that that is Lyndon Johnson. I mean, it could be a fictional president, but that that was a very specific cover of Life magazine, a very specific cover, and it was the Lyndon Johnson cover, and from the end of December uh, of 1963. And I, I think that they're saying a lot there. They're they're telling us that one. I think, and I don't know anything about this, but I think the Fantastic Four was a name that was given to reed richard sue storm johnny storm and ben Grimm while they were astronauts astronauts yes you know yes. and and because that came and th that makes sense i mean i love the idea 
that coming out of the space program, I mean, they're going to, and they have the right stuff. So they have this bravado that the astronauts, the Mercury, the right stuff's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's fantastic. Uh, it's so good. And, and, and what's the, the, the integrated crew equivalent of that. So the fantastic four were probably, you know, big heroes, but they were heroes. They weren't superheroes, you mm -hmm. know, so they go up and I would imagine, you know, that the name sticks and we saw that they're already the fantastic four. So maybe we, we meet them before or after their accident, but maybe, you know, they're not, the world doesn't necessarily know how powerful they all are yet. Or I don't, I don't know how, I mean, they knew who Ben Grimm is. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I would imagine whatever happens, they're going to go on some big John, John Byrne, Jonathan Hickman, cosmic adventure. Here's hoping, you know, a nihilist or the negative zone or whatever, but I'll mm -hmm. bet you they're they're because that would make them also very interesting when they come into the modern age. And again, that's Marvel going back and going, well, it worked for Captain America really well. And it makes the characters immediately. And by the way, they don't even necessarily have to come from the 616 Earth. No. Like, what if they came from an Art Deco world of tomorrow future that, you know, very Kirby-esque kind of with, with that yeah. future, you know, re retro futurism and all that. And then they wind up in our universe, which is why it makes sense why nobody knows who or has never heard of them, or they just haven't gotten around to talking about them. But it would be very interesting if that were the case. Well, it could be as simple as them going off into some adventure in space, like you mentioned, then coming back and it's now 2024. Right. Four because you know, they, they, they went time, you know, like, time dilation, yeah. Time I mean, dilation. So, but but you know what makes me upset about this, Rob? You you just gave me a give me goosebumps. There's a lot of great ideas right there, and they never they never listen to us. They never listen to you. Never ever. <laughs> well, yeah, What's I mean, wrong with it, them? It, it's it well, it's it's difficult because the the big drawback that I've had in my life is I've never gone fully over to the Hollywood side. I've retained my fanboy nature. And, um, it, but, but then again, I, I think that people know less now. Um, I mean, I at least have a literary background, you know, I've read a lot of books yes, <laughs> and I haven't just watched TV shows and movies, even though I've done a lot of that. But, but I think that a, a lot of the, you know, you watch certain like Gary nerd Roddick did a video where he started uh, last week and it was a montage of all these writers that hadn't read the comics. And like the head writer of She-Hulk, I'm like, how do you not read John Byrne's She-Hulk run before you do the comic? I mean, the the adaptation because they wanted to go in that direction, and Byrne already showed us the way how to do it effectively. Mm -hmm. And then by the, the the TV writers not going that direction, I'm like, I don't, I wouldn't wear that as a badge of honor. No, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't adapt a novel having not read the novel, you know, I mean, that's so silly to me that you're not going to go in there and, and read the comics. And the problem is, is even now there's a great prejudice against comic books. They, they, a lot of people don't understand that the comic writing of a lot of these writers was very sophisticated mm -hmm. and it was, it, 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 but there's this prejudice against comics, you know, and that, that, so these writers go, well, I didn't, I'm going to do the character, but I'm not going to read the comic to me. Like, why would you even, why would you agree to take a job to adapt a character that exists in this medium and then not read the medium that the character's from? And did, I, if I'm not mistaken, she was actually, kind of had disdain for the comics too. She was like, nah, there's that attitude of, I don't, you know, just, I don't like them. I don't want to be, I don't want to read them and do my own. Well, there's thing. also, there's also an attitude of these are antiquated. These are male power, patriarchal fantasies. So we're yeah. going to change them and turn them into something. And I'm like, okay, well, there's a reason why they've been popular and there's a reason why they've existed this long. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it might be because of the power fantasies that they display. That's kind of the entire point of superheroes. And now we watched the deconstruction of superheroes in the 80s. You know, we mm -hmm. saw how 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 characters were brought down to earth. I mean, 
it, Frank Miller did that with uh, Daredevil. Frank Miller did that with Batman. Batman. I mean, you read Batman Year One, and it's it's, and when people talk about being a deconstruction, it was m- basically making the characters. The characters were had three or four dimensions, but when Frank Miller started to write Batman like that, Batman suddenly had ten dimensions to it. Right, right. You know, and and I think that was um, um, uh, that's just something that happened with the medium. Uh, you know, the medium was simple by design, and it was the writers in the seventies. You know, it was people like Neil Adams and and um, Neil. Um, uh, Denny O'Neill, yeah. uh, who are, who are doing Batman comics, and we're adding a lot more pathos and emotional depth to the character than we'd seen before, especially coming out of the '60s show and the comic books emulated what was on TV. Right. It's it, how you would not go back and 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 uh, and research this stuff and read this stuff again. I, I, it boggles my mind. I don't. And, and uh, why would you even hire someone like that? Well, I know why they hire people like that. <laughs> Not, well, I mean, that, it, the, the funny thing is, is like, I'm all for hearing the stories of people I haven't heard stories from. I mean, I want to hear brand new stories that I've never heard before. Uh, give the, give me those stories. Give them to me. Yeah. But but when you put people like that onto when they're not going to give you what they're supposed to be adapting, it's kind of weird to me. I've seen it with Star Trek, you know, and when, uh, not to make this about Star Trek, but Alex okay. Kurtzman, when he says, we're going to use Star Trek and we're going to use it for our messaging. Yeah, well, first no. of all, I have to ask myself, why do you think that you have a message at all? Mm-hmm. Much less, I mean, great stories have all kinds of messages inherently built into them. You, you, I mean, everybody now feels themselves a crusader of some kind. Like, I'm going to tell my audience that they just don't understand these things. So here I am. Let me take this opportunity to get on my soapbox and insert it into this superhero story so you understand. And it's like, why are you more important than the character themselves? Yeah. And, you know, we we saw that backlash. You, you know that comic book store owner recently in the last couple months? Okay. That came out and was, he was, I don't know if you saw him, he was a, it went viral online where he was talking about how bad comic books are and how Marvel and DC, and he was like your typical comic book guy, comic book owner. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But he was right. Mm -hmm. You know, and Mark Millar came and said, come on my show. And, and a lot of people made fun of him, but the thing is the proof's in the pudding. Mm -hmm. And, and when comic book stories are like, you look at something like to me, watching Captain America, the winter soldier was like reading daredevil born again from frank miller where you took the character of captain america you you gave him sam wilson you gave him black widow and you inserted him into a story that was a 70s conspiracy thriller even bringing back robert redford from three days of the condor and all the president's men and Mm -hmm. you know and and you you told the story about the surveillance culture and the fact that our our government had been infiltrated by hydra you elevated what comic book movies were thought about when they injected all of this really interesting modern day stuff about our, our surveillance, the fact that we can be surveilled now from shield helicarriers from Mm -hmm. a distance, you know, and if they wanted to take out a thousand people, including Dr. Strange, they could, that was really relevant. And that turned the comic book movie into something that went, it was still a great comic book movie. It was a great captain America story. But it went beyond Captain America and became a relevant movie to our time. It spoke to the world we live in today. It was a great movie. Now, I would flip that around and go, if you watch the Marvels, what does that have to say? The story itself had no connection. It was so goofy. And it was so, like, not... I, I mean... It's it's amazing to me you go from the Winter Soldier to the Marvels. Now I know a lot has come from is in between there, but but even like Civil War, they might not have adapted the comic directly, but the the beef that they have that that um, Tony Stark and Steve Rogers had was a very legitimate one. Mm-hmm. You know, where Captain America, you'd think he would be on the side that Tony Stark is on, but no, it's the other way around. Yeah, it's the other way, way around, and that was a really legitimate question of government oversight and. Who who are they to say that how 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 who are they to say that we should they're gonna tell us what to do? Yeah. And that was a really interesting that had a lot of relevance beyond being a simple comic book story. And that's what made it great. And they were they were pounding us over the head with it. Like it's just the the, the messaging wasn't 
the key part of that movie. You know what I mean? It wasn't the main event. It was a part of the film, but it wasn't like <laughs> what we're getting in all these other movies. Like, they, like, like they're like you said, they're it's go goofy stories of three ladies who are superheroes doing what? How is this serving this universe that you've built? What the hell's going on? And it was just awful. Yeah, it's awful, right? So let's hope the Fantastic Four doesn't go down. I don't think it will. I mean, getting back to that again, I think. Uh, I think they've, I, I mean, going back to what uh, it was Iger said at that, sem that symposium a few months ago, uh, you know, too much, too much quantity, not enough quality. We're going to get back to back to the form and start putting out some good quality stuff. Let's, you know. And he was right. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, Kevin Feige making three or four movies a year was a lot, but then saddling him with having, you know, Disney plus comes yeah. along and says, okay, you have to make six shows for us a year. And it's like, did you guys consult with us before we did that? We could have worked that in. I mean, they, they were planning these movies years in advance. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a reason why we were making as much money for you as we were, because we were th carefully thinking through all this. And now you're just telling us to make all of these shows. And um, that's kind of ridiculous. So... Yeah, I think you were right when you said that after Endgame we needed to restart. I think they now I don't think they they had the rights to do Fantastic Four at that time. It wasn't ready to. They had it, I think, but it wasn't like the, the deal wasn't done with 20th Century Fox. I don't believe so. But I would have liked to pause personally, just a pause, because Endgame was a big deal. It led up to this thing. Everybody was so excited. It was a great experience. It was a, it was it was very well received. Then pause, and then imagine they pause for a year, and then. Fantastic Four comes out in 1960, you know, based in 1963 or, or another, like, you know, uh, multiverse, whatever. But a restart would have been amazing. Amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. and, and I think that that's, um, I, I, look, great stories well told. It doesn't matter what medium you're working in. That's always the goal. And, and you need, you need care, you, you need writers that understand the story is not about them. They should be writing a story that is about the the great human truths. And um, all of our stories that have endured through time are stories that are true about what does it mean to be a human being on earth and having to make those daily struggles because those struggles haven't changed. Do you think the Deadpool movie is going to segue into FF a little bit or something? Is the FF the next big one after Deadpool or is there something else coming? Do you know the, the release dates? No. Well, the Thunderbolts is before. I I don't know. I think Captain America Brave New World is up in the air. Right. So from what I understand, we go from... Reshoots, I think. I yeah, we go from Wolverine and uh, Deadpool and Wolverine in July to Thunderbolts on May 2nd of 2025. So there's going to be a 10-month gap. And then Fantastic Four comes out in July of 2025. And they've started filming Thunderbolts already then. I didn't think they already started production on it. I don't think that they've started at... They might be back. They, it was prepping before the strike. So there's a lot of work that's been done on that film. Just like a lot of Deadpool and Wolverine was filmed before the strike. So I'm sure they had a lot of time to edit during the strike. Because what they'd shot, they can get it into shape effects work could still be done the thing about deadpool and wolverine i'm really excited for it and judging by how many people are watching that trailer because you have both x-men fans from the fox x-men verse and the mcu fans and people that love i mean basically to me deadpool and wolverine is a fox movie yeah <laughs> and and um it, it's the last fox x-men film but the deadpool franchise both of those movies made close to 800 million and so you've got that and then you've got the x-men movies which also would make about the same amount of money the good ones like days mm -hmm. of future past and mm -hmm. so i would say put those two together the potential there even though it's kind of the same audience but certainly a billion dollar movie i All only worry i only long. worry that it could wind up seeming too gimmicky you know, all, all the time stuff and the T the time variance authority and all that. And I know that the, the, uh, it, it, the thing about Deadpool, despite all of the funny shenanigans is both of those movies had plots that were easily understood. They weren't overly complex right. and that's what made them, 
I think Deadpool is legitimately the first one is a pretty great movie. Mm -hmm. But at the at the at the base of it, you have a guy take the Deadpool out of it, but it's a guy who wants to be with his girlfriend. Yep. You know, and and it's a very easily the 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 core story is easily understood, whereas the core story in this movie is not. The core story in this movie is about multiverse shenanigans, the time variance authority. It's it's already way off into oblivion. And that's the only thing will an uh, if it's not grounded, will an audience be able to buy into it because you're asking a lot of an audience. So if it's too out there, it might alienate the normal movie going public. That's the only thing I would worry about. That yeah, makes a lot of sense. I wonder if uh I wonder if people have to if do you think people are going to need to watch these, you know, the Loki series to understand what's going on? I I don't I don't think so because no. obviously you've got if if Owen Wilson was in it, I'd say maybe. Right. But the idea of the time they're basically time cops. Right. And everybody will understand that what a time cop is. They don't even have to get into the tree of whatever Loki's yeah. at now. They won't have, I mean I'm sure that that'll play into it at some point, but they don't have to deal with all of that. Right. There, that you just find out that there's a uh, there's an organization outside of time and people will get it. They just have to that cuz that's all they need to do is say, "Well, we are the time cops and you've you've screwed up the timeline, Wade." You know, at the end of the last movie, you 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 killed you killed Ryan Reynolds before he got to make Green lantern yeah so you've screwed up the universe you know you killed you did all these things that we had to go fix and now you have to help us put it all back together everybody will get that and even if you've never seen loki they'll still understand what that is and they'll set it up and i think it was great to um have mcfadden in the role of owen wilson bring somebody new in that's running this area of the time variance authority so all i want is for him to kill <laughs> Ghost and uh, and uh, uh, Taskmaster. That's well, they, yeah, but they're in they're in uh, Thunderbolts. That's why I asked you this sort of filming or not already. Because I was hoping that maybe they'll make a change. You know, it'd be cool if they could just go and change things that just didn't work. Because some things just didn't work, right? You know, just go back and if they could admit that they things didn't work, which they won't. You know. But that, look, yeah. look, Mark Marco says here, actually, interestingly enough, I don't really agree about the Marvels. I thought it was a good movie. I think, however, it was hurt by uh, an artificial timeline to get a film out and that people had to watch a TV show first. Yeah. Well, uh, did they have to watch a TV show first? I don't know if they had to watch it. Well, the characters, the yeah. they, 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 Miss Marvel and, and uh, Monica Rambeau, you know, I just, I just thought that the storyline was pretty uninteresting. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it was, it was kind of goofy. I mean, I would love to have seen a movie about Captain Marvel. What did she, she talks about? How the universe was falling apart during the snap, and she was out there trying to um, fix everything. What was that right. like for her? I would love to have seen a story set in that uh, arena. And all we got was flashbacks of that, really quick flashbacks of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, everyone hates, I, I actually don't mind Brie Larson actually as, as Captain Marvel. I don't mind her, you know? No, I don't, I, I didn't mind her. I just think that they didn't give her, I mean, she's an Academy Award winning actress. Yeah. Um, I, I think that they could have, um, you know, done more with that. Totally. You know, totally. and so. I, I've always wanted to see the rogue you know, the Avengers annual 10. I want to see Rogue take her powers. I oh, that's one of my favorite comic books of all time. Yeah, I love man. that comic. Me too. And I, I, I want to see that. I want to see that happen. Because I, I just thought that Rogue wasn't uh, done properly in the X-Men films. You know, she was kind of, nah, you know, whatever, whiny and whatever. Didn't have an accent either, which kind of bothered me. I want that Southern, I want that Southern accent in Rogue. Uh, and, and then she didn't have the powers that she has. She's pretty damn powerful, right? But um yeah, I was hoping that maybe they would do something with that. Of course, I I knew they wouldn't do something like with that. But I mean, uh, could we ever see? I guess we could see that now, though, right? I mean, it could pop up that we see Captain Marvel injured and then Rogue touching her and taking her. her yeah, powers. I mean, it's going to be really interesting what they do, you know, how that's all going to play out. 
Well, one thing I can say for sure, Rob, is that again, you guys talk about superhero fatigue. I don't believe it exists. I think it's a bunch. Of, I, it's a bunch of malarkey. I, I don't it, look. No. There's no such thing as any fatigue. It, it, every franchise is one movie away from being great again. It just has to be great. That's it. That's it. You know, that's so, all you need. Uh, it's all you need. It's easy to do. How hard is it to make a movie? Your director was easy. Well, it's right? it it's actually really hard, <laughs> but um. Yeah, um, I it, look, it's all about the writing, you know, and the execution and the story that's being told. And I think, you know, one of the things that I, I did not like, like, for instance, going back to Marvels, like there's a scene where Darben goes to this, like the moon where she digs up the, the right band. I was watching that going, uh, this, this looks like the moon from Superman 2. <laughs> it, 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 it like you're clearly on a sound stage. I'm looking at this going, this is not this is not what Marvel usually gives us. And I kept thinking about how the moon looks in from the earth to the moon or how it looked in uh, for all mankind or how it looked in in the movie First Man. The, and I'm just watching these two these three characters, you know, every time they use their powers, they're shifting around and the flurkins eating the crew of the oh, ship so I they can get better. I mean, all that stuff, it, it was just one goofy thing compiled on top of one goofy thing. And the way Sam Jackson was written. Yeah. And it was like you're watching. It's 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 as if because the movie's about three girls, they had to pull. They, they didn't make it credible. It wasn't credible. Like, these characters still have to be credible. They still have to be capable. They, I mean, you, you, you think about Captain Marvel being a Kree warrior. I mean, she's a badass. She's like James Bond. And so when she's not acting like a badass, it's like, what, what is this goofiness? Why am I watching these characters? Why do they have to be goofy just because they're girls? I'm like, give me, give me some badassery here. Yeah, I, was, I showed my class, my film class, this, the Kill Bill fight scene, right? Uh, her versus all the, you know, the ninjas and such. It was freaking like 15 minutes of gore and craziness. It was great. It was fantastic. Wow. Um, you know, uh, but you remind, you know, I told, honestly, I forgot about the Furkin thing and I forgot about the villain. That's how bad this movie was. Sorry, sorry, Marco. I disagree. I, it was not my favorite film. That villain was so frustrating to me. I didn't even know her name at all until like near the end. I, they mentioned at the end. I'm like, I was, I think I actually yelled at the screen at one point because I was kind of frustrated with how it wasn't going right. It wasn't going good. For lack of a better word, but yeah, yeah. And those Furkins, man, those were that. I hate those stupid cats. Get rid of the cats, and I hate the freaking goats in that stupid Thor Love and Thunder. I hate the goats. Okay, I'll laugh once, maybe twice. And I'm done. Don't don't keep using this same joke, same joke. Like, yeah, that was frustrating. That, that kind of stuff drives me nuts. So as I get agitated, yep. as, you know. But hey, I, I I think they've learned their lesson. I hope they've learned the lesson. The Fantastic Four looks like the Fantastic Four to me. That's a good first start. I, I think so too. So I'm going to keep it positive. I, 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 I'm I really excited. I have missed. I have missed being excited for these movies. I've missed, uh, you know, uh, learning about, you know, trying to figure out what's going to happen. I miss getting excited, like I said, and I miss going to the movies with my, with my family and, and, cheering and having a great time because it hasn't happened for a very long time i really do miss it and, and i think a lot of people do too hence the reason why this deadpool trailer got so many hits uh people just want like you said they want a damn good movie that's like you're yearning for it they're, they'll pay for it bring us back man bring us back Disney, uh, that's what we back. want that's all we want and we won't even talk about star wars so we'll be here for 33 hours listen rob thanks so much for coming by today sure i mean yeah. you, you know uh it's great i mean i love what you do and you. um I, uh, I've always loved, you know, you do such a great job with the comics and, and it's always fun to talk this stuff. I'm sorry I've yammered away so much. No, yammer. I love bringing, you are a wealth of knowledge. I, I love listening to your, 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 uh, your YouTube channel. Often I'll be working right over there and I'll have you, I don't watch you. I listen to you. Uh, you know, you read, listen guys, if you want, uh, if you are a movie buff, you must, you absolutely must subscribe to Robert Meyer Burnett's, uh, YouTube channel, the Burnett work. Uh, well, gonna, thank you. Oh yeah, he's got a great community over there. Great people doing great work, and Rob goes online many times in the week. Oftentimes, too late for me to watch, but I catch it on the replay usually the next day. 
And again, if you love movies, he's he's deep diving into that stuff. And you are Rob, uh, you are a uh, you know you say you know we say you're a writer, a director, producer. You're also a teacher, my friend. You are a teacher. I've learned all. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You've learned a. Lo- I've learned a lot from you uh, about fil- uh, films and and even comic books. And I thought I was a comic aficionado. You are a true guru. You know. Well, I mean, it, it, you know what? I'm just a fan who who casts a wide net. Yep. I, I I I'm just interested in all kind, not just geek culture, but culture in general. You know, it's frustrating when when people when we you you try and have conversations about movies and TV shows and stuff, and people will say like, "Oh, I don't want to talk about politics." How can you read a comic called Captain America and not talk about politics? Like, I don't, especially the Captain America movies. Like Winter Soldier is so political. You know, and 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 civil war. Civil war is actually called civil war. Like it's it's incredibly political. I mean, the 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 rift between Tony Stark and Steve Rogers in that movie is literally about government oversight as opposed to no government oversight. It the whole their whole argument is a political argument. And I'm so there for that kind of stuff because we live in the real world. And I love it when our escapism has something to say about our experience or about you know living what does it mean to live in the real world and i think that that's something that that great comic books i mean howard shaken's american flag one of my favorite comics of all time was incredibly political and i was reading all kinds of like underground comics like the fabulous furry freak brothers or you know r crumb stuff and a lot of what what i was reading as a kid in the 70s it was wholly inappropriate for me to read totally uh, was all political and and um, it's weird nowadays because I guess growing up in the 70s and watching being a movie fan as a kid, y- you know, I think about they were all political. You know, all the movies, Vietnam, people come home from Vietnam, Rambo. Rambo is a total political movie. Do we, get to, do we get to win this time? You know, yeah. I mean, all that stuff. And and I feel that that's something that we we need to remember. Because a lot of people just want escapism, but the best escapism has something to say. They don't want to think a lot of people. They just want to go and, you know, lose themselves sometimes. Uh, It it is frustrating because, well, look at what's getting made too. Movies, like you just mentioned Corvette Summer, you mentioned, you know, uh, these movies aren't getting made anymore. Like you said, they don't make these these quaint, cool, coming-of-age movies. These, you know, you don't see them anymore. Uh, no, I, I mean, bad, it's, right? a, it, it's a strange thing. I mean, nowadays, you think about, like, Stand By Me, which yeah. came out in 1986, four kids going to see a dead body on a train track, you know, out in the woods in their Oregon town. And it's, it's, that's a great film about youth, but, but the idea that they're going to see a dead body, it's like, today I feel somebody would object to that. You can't make a movie about kids going to see a dead body. I'm like, are you kidding me? We got we just today we had a mass shooting at a fucking parade about the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh my god, that happened today? I had no idea. Yeah, it happened today. Uh, one person was killed and and uh, eleven people were injured, and there were two shooters, two shooters at the Kansas City Chiefs victory parade. What does that say about this country? Yeah, it's scary, man. It's scary where people are angry. People are angry. People are. I, I don't. I can't even answer that question. I have no idea. I, it's I don't know. Star Wars is bad. Yeah, if Star Wars was better. People would be happier. Well, temporarily. I kid. I, kid, I, I know. I Tem- temporarily, I see. I mean, we can't. You know, I, I watch a lot of political um, uh, shows on, on YouTube too. I love watching. Uh, you mentioned Bill Maher or Alice. I watched him. Um, I watch him quite a lot. Getting stoned and drinking his, yeah. his uh, tequilas, talking to a variety of different people. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. You, you know. Uh, America is is the you know an awesome country I think it is and uh, we're still the place that I mean it's so funny yeah. we talk about oh immigrants coming here but we're still the country all the immigrants want to come to well that, and there's that, a reason that's that's it but what I can't understand I just can't understand when people leave the shit and they come to you know, we're going political now they leave the shit and they come to a country like Canada or, or, or you know United States they bring that baggage with them and they protest and they fight for a country that that they've left behind they left behind. Why'd you come here? Why'd you come here to just bring to cause more? And then they cause strife here. Like, uh, again, yeah, I, wanna... well, I know you guys are having a lot of strife. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were very similar to what's happening down there, too. 
I mean, in regards to, again, I don't want to go down that whole no. happening in the Middle East and all that, but I mean, some of the, some of the things I'm seeing said being said and some of the signs signage I'm seeing, I'm like, what the yeah. hell are you people talking about? What, what's wrong with you? You know, you, I mean, it's funny that America might not be perfect, but if you looked up until about 10 years ago, the direction that the country was on in terms of uh, equality, acceptance, all that, we were on a really good path. Evolutionarily, we were we were on a normal path, and that was completely derailed by forces that intentionally did that. And, um, you know, social media was the weapon of choice, and uh, it's very easy to pull that trigger. And unfortunately, we're going through an evolutionary period. What does it mean to have all the social media we have? And I'm, I, it's, I think it's going to go on for another, for decades. And it's going to be interesting to see where humanity comes out. And I think one of the great things about fantasy and escapism, science fiction as a genre has always tried to make sense of the world, the age that we live in. You know, and and I think that great science fiction and great comic books. I mean, how again, Howard Chaykin's American Flag, which is really a parody of there's so much a parody of television culture, television consumer culture. It's such a the first those first like twelve issues were so great. And um, for those who haven't read American Flag, a lot of RoboCop, a lot of the tone of RoboCop with the media breaks and all that was very American Flag esque. To the point where I think Howard Chaykin even got a special thanks at the end or something. Hmm. But um, that was I, you know, I think that's what that's what genre stuff has done. You know, horror films have always reflected kind of the times, the post Vietnam horror films like Texas Chainsaw, Night of the Living Dead, um, and the the horror of the, the Hills Have Eyes, Last House on the Left. Those really hardcore movies of the seventies were definitely a reflection of of the country going through the civil rights era and going through the Vietnam era and protests and all that. And we see reflections in our politics and our pop uh, in our pop culture. And so it's, or it's all sort of intertwined. And I think one of the great things about comic books and science fiction and fantasy is you can attack political issues head on, but if you do it in a science fiction context, it makes it more palatable right. for people. So it doesn't immediately start a divide. I mean, you think about something like Blade Runner. You know, the idea, what are the what are the ethical implications about making replicants? You know, people that if if we can make machines, Battlestar Galactica was all about that. You know, what happens when we make beings that emulate us? Do they have souls? And what does that mean? And how are we going to... What If we create living machines that are self-aware... How we treat those machines has a lot to say about our own ethical uh, and moral principles as 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 a race, and it's going to be interesting. You deal with that in a show like Galactica, or you deal with that in comic books. People are much more open to accept interesting ideas that way, and that's why I think uh, genre uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror in all of its myriad forms, whether it's literature, whether it's movies, whether it's comics, is still very important. And a lot of the time, people that aren't fans of that stuff tend to look down on it when they don't realize how important it actually can be. And it can start conversations, which would has, which, which is what has to happen, right? Yeah. Um, you know, de debate, friendly debate, not angry debate. And No, and, and Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone was the granddaddy of all modern media. I mean, he was able to get away with so much social commentary at the time because people were like, oh, no, it's not real. It's The Twilight Zone. That's right. Well, Star Trek did a lot of that too. Next they generation did. did, man. 100%. I, 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 you know, I was not an original OG Star Trek fan. Uh, I, I, I got into Star Trek this generation in like in my last year of high school and I, and I, I caught up. I binged a lot of it. It was like syndicated by the time I was in university. I watched all of that and I became a diehard Next Generation fan. I, then I got back to the, and I used to watch some of the old stuff, but yeah. I went back and watched all of it. Oh, Next Gen, you know, you talk about Mr. Data too, like the trial, the episode with the trial. The, the Measure of a Man, man from the right. second season. Like, amazing, right? Like everything you're just talking about. It, it's and then, you, and then it starts conversation. Um, I think actually one of my teachers at the school is doing that, use that episode for uh, for a philosophy class they're in right now. So, yeah, it totally is important. That's that's important. The problem is this. The problem is this. This son of a gun right here. This is the problem. That's the black mirror. That's the that's black what that mirror. That show's man. all about. That's it. And the fact that something happens 
overseas, we know instantaneously. You mentioned the seventies, how things were. Well, we didn't, you know, we didn't have that globalization where everything was so readily available. Now right. we are impatient and we have access to everything immediately. And that's a danger. Toronto, there's the school boards trying to outlaw these in the, in the school. Finally, good idea guys about time, you know, um, the parents want their kids to have these. They, they want to be connected at all times to their children. So yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a scary thing. Scary, scary thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rob, again, thank you so much. <laughs> this is great, man. Yeah. Uh, stick yeah, around. Always, gonna... always a pleasure. Yes, I'll say goodbye. Stick around for a second. I'll say goodbye to our, our friends here, and then I'll come back and say goodbye to you myself, guys. Let me go to my uh, set my own screen there. How you doing? Thanks so much for popping by again. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Robert Meyer Burnett. Again, if you haven't had a chance to do so yet, get on over to the Burnett Network. That's his uh, YouTube channel and give him a follow. Again, he does weekly shows, like actually more than weekly shows, almost sometimes every other day. Fantastic. You can also find Robert over on the John Campia show uh, once in a while. Not all the time, but he's he guest stars over there uh, once, or tw once or twice a week, I believe. Um, if you are local to Toronto and you want to meet me, the Comic Doctor, I'll be at the Toronto Comic Book Convention uh, show Sorry, this Sunday from 10 till 4, taking submissions for pressing and cleaning and CGC grading. Nipur will be there with me as well. So I hope you can come by and, and say hi. Again, you don't have to drop off anything. Just come by and introduce yourself and say hello. It'll be great to meet you. Uh, I have other boxes on their way back from CGC as we speak. Uh, so there'll be another CGC live CGC unboxing this coming Tuesday. You're not going to want to miss that. Guys, thanks so much. Have a great night and see you again very soon. All the best. Bye for now.